Nickelodeon has had a foot in the film industry for a little over two decades. They're responsible for the trend of movie adaptations of cartoons that was big in the late 90s and early 2000s, but they've also released a couple of original animated movies as well, some that kick off TV shows and others that stand on their own. Today I'll be going through all of the animated movies Nick has released, including their TV movies, since there were barely enough of them to fit this list if I were to only count theatrical releases. And also I wanted to talk about the Jungle movie in a timely fashion. You may be asking, why not count the live action movies too? Well, outside of maybe one or two movies, most of those have very mediocre review scores, and I really didn't want to sit through The Last Airbender. Don't even get me started on the live action TV movies. What are your talents, Frank? I... I'm a good singer. No! Despite the limits I set for myself, I wasn't able to watch every single animated TV movie, which I counted as being a three or four part episode. So sadly, you will not be seeing any of the Rocket Power movies on this list. Sorry to disappoint all seven of the Rocket Power fans that watch my videos. Without further ado, this is my top 10 Nickelodeon animated movies. I have nostalgia for that, for the opening chords to Paul Simon's Father and Daughter. The song was made for the Wild Thornberries movie. I hadn't even seen the movie until weeks ago, but I remember this song so clearly. It was used in the trailer for it, which I saw a lot when I was younger, since it played before one of the Spongebob DVDs that I used to have. The trailer itself is bad, as it gives away the most interesting part of the movie and spoils its twist, though the twist itself is obvious even in the movie. This is a trend that just about all of the movies on this list follow, both new and old, and it really needs to stop, especially since a movie's advertising can leave a big impact on the movie itself no matter how good or bad the movie itself is. And that's exactly what happened with me. This trailer is by no means a big part of my childhood. In fact, it was probably the first time I had even heard of the Wild Thornberries. But the song stuck with me and I didn't even realize it. I mean, it makes sense, it's Paul Simon. But it gave me a really weird feeling when I heard it during this movie. It was like I was uncovering a long lost memory when listening to it. And that's something that doesn't happen often. It's a very special feeling, and unfortunately, the rest of the movie isn't nearly as special. This movie does a great job introducing the show to new people, but it does a pretty poor job of raising the stakes up from the TV show. When making this list, I started watching the Wild Thornberry special episode, The Origin of Donnie, until I realized that its premise shared a lot with this movie. A Thornberry goes missing in a forest, a relative arrives to help the family, and there's a threat of poachers. Now, both handle these conflicts differently and aren't nearly identical, but it shows that the amount of creativity put into this this movie was fairly low. The best idea the writers seemed to have was to ship Eliza to England and put her in boarding school, but it only acts as a minor inconvenience in Eliza's journey that the movie quickly forgets about once it ends. Now most of this film is fine, it's fairly funny, the characters are just as great as they were in the show, and it looks pretty gorgeous. But what elevates this movie onto the list is the third act. The thing that Eliza values most is taken away from her, and she has to save hundreds of animals from being poached. The stakes are high, the tone is intense, and the ending of the movie actually changes the status quo of the series in a small way. This is the kind of stuff that I was expecting from this movie from the start, and it's very satisfying. But to get to it, you have to sit through an hour of stuff that's just okay. With this and Rugrats Go Wild being produced by the same studio and coming out within half a year of each other, and the former also having a rough production cycle, I think that the script for this movie may have been rushed, and that's why it felt so underwhelming. But I still enjoyed this movie. I've got no major issues with it, and if you're a big fan of the series, you'll probably like it more than I did. But if there's anything to take away from this movie, it's that Paul Simon will probably haunt me for the rest of my life. I'm gonna watch you shine, gonna watch you grow. It's crazy that this film actually turned out to be as enjoyable as it was. It uses the cliche of a new baby joining the cast which so many cartoons, and by that I mean two, have abused. And yet, this movie uses its new character to teach a moral about responsibility, and does it really well. Sure, Baby Dill's nearly constant crying is super annoying, and he's only really useful when the script demands it, but the characters constantly call him out on his behavior, and learn to respect him for who he is in a pretty natural way. All he cares about now is Baby Dill! Don't now the story in this movie is handled really well, but along with the introduction of Dill, this is probably the moment where the Rugrats jump the shark. 
The first act is pretty standard fare for the franchise, with an added dose of heartbreaking moments. Though that's not including the explosion of CGI effects that occurs when Dee Dee gives birth to Dill, or the musical numbers where a bunch of ugly babies talk about just being born and this happens. Man, they cut my cord. Oh, consider yourself lucky. This is actually just one of many musical numbers featured throughout the film. Some are sung by the characters and others are licensed pop tunes. None of them are very memorable, and considering that Rugrats wasn't known for its musical numbers, I have no clue why this was a musical besides to push the soundtrack. But it's far from the only weird thing in this movie. When it enters its second act, this movie goes off the rails and I love every minute of it. A small push sends the babies rocketing through their whole town to the tune of a hardcore rap, as they avoid nearly dying multiple times. The babies end up lost in the woods where they somehow don't starve to death and also encounter a bunch of rabid circus monkeys whose train just so happened to crash in the woods. Also, this actually happens in a Rugrats movie and Spike fights a wolf and nearly drowns in a river. I think that a good movie adaptation of a TV show should raise the stakes and offer something new that the show normally wouldn't. The Rugrats movie chooses to do this by making a series about talking babies as dark as it can without becoming a parody of itself. The whole movie works towards this goal and it's so crazy and weird that I can't help but really enjoy it. I'm fine with the movie that's solid all the way through, but the unexpected insanity that fills the Rugrats movie makes it worth watching in my book. The Adventures of Tintin is simply a solid movie. It was directed by Steven Spielberg and produced by Peter Jackson, so why wouldn't it be? It's based off of a popular Belgium comic series from the 1940s. I never read it, but it was very popular back in elementary school, since back then it was the closest you could get to reading a comic book in school. I really like the simple character designs and bright colors that the comics used, and I kind of wish that the movie was animated in 2D with that style. As they are, the visuals are a mixed bag for me. The characters are animated with motion capture, and while that technology can look really great when used to bring human qualities to something that isn't human, like with most of Andy Serkis' characters, but when used to animate humans, it makes them look more realistic for sure, but restricts the amount of creativity you can get out of the animation. The characters in purely motion capture movies like these never look quite right. Everything beyond the characters looks really good though, and it's used to bring some very impressive action sequences to life, especially with a really, really great motorcycle chase towards the end. Though half the time, this movie does look like you're watching someone play Uncharted, and it's very distracting. Probably the best way to describe Tintin is by calling it an animated Indiana Jones. The tone is slightly more cartoonish, but they both have unlikely duos tricking across the world to stop a bad dude from stealing treasure. But don't let the PG rating fool you. Bits of this film are just as dark or adult as an indie movie. While there aren't any dark death traps, someone gets shot in the back within the first half hour, and the whole joke with the character Captain Haddock is that he's an alcoholic, so much to the point that being sober helps him remember important details he forgot long ago. Honestly, your opinion on the Indiana Jones trilogy and Spielberg's movies in general will probably be similar to how you feel about this movie. While they aren't completely on par with each other, they both offer pretty good action, adventure, and characters. There was just nothing in Tintin specifically that really grabbed me. I enjoyed this movie, but I'm not in a rush to revisit it, like I am with many of the other films on this list. Tintin fans are pretty split on whether or not this movie was loyal to the source material, but I think that everyone can agree on something. It was miles better than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I know that I'm going to get some hate for this entry. Honestly, this ranking was probably more of a surprise to me than it is to you. And going into this video, I honestly thought that it would top the list. I mean, I've probably seen this movie more than any other movie ever. But allow me to explain myself. The SpongeBob SquarePants movie is not the best adaptation of a cartoon out there, but it's a very good effort. This film takes just about every part of the show and turns it up to 11. The live action segments actually have a budget, though they're just as cheesy and fun as the patchy stuff. The animation has great expressions that don't overstate stay their welcome, and shading that's almost on par with Sponge Out of Water, the new settings are diverse and some look like rock bottom on steroids, the plot pushes Spongebob and Patrick to their limits, and explores themes that go to the root of what the series stands for. It also has no questions asked, the best celebrity cameo of all time in anything ever. Who are you? I'm David Hasselhoff. Hooray! Even if you have no clue who and what David Hasselhoff and Baywatch are, I think that the Hoff's appearance in this movie is so ridiculous that it's funny no matter what. They even went so far as to create a double-sized replica of Hasselhoff and stage an entire fight scene on his back. 
SpongeBob is a show that never takes itself seriously, even in situations that could be treated as matters of life or death. But this movie manages to actually put the characters into serious situations and still make it seem believable. The trench SpongeBob and Patrick navigate is filled with some really disturbing imagery, and the scene where the pair are on their deathbed in Shell City is just depressing. Even if it leads to a fake out death, the scene is filled with so much sweetness and raw emotion that it almost deserves it. Even throughout some moments like these, the movie still tries to be funny. The comedy is probably the weakest part of it though. It reels back the weirdness and is a little more predictable and juvenile than the show's humor is. Part of this movie still makes me laugh a lot, especially everything about the Tug Thug sequence. But the movie puts its plot and character development first, which is a little disappointing for an adaptation of a show that's known for its comedy, and also because those parts of the movie have their problems as well. The new characters are kind of a mixed bag. Dennis is really intimidating, and I love the moments where he goes to the location SpongeBob and Patrick already visited and brutally hurts the people they encountered. He's taken care of far too easily when the duo first meet him, and the quote unquote fight that he has with SpongeBob on top of Hasselhoff later on is better, but again, he's defeated by sheer luck. And this makes Dennis feel underwhelming despite being a character with a cool concept. King Neptune is fun to watch, but he's honestly kind of a straw man whose outlook never changes throughout the whole movie. Mindy is fine too, but outside of one or two moments with her, she wasn't very entertaining. She was mostly used to give exposition and motivation to SpongeBob and Patrick. And while I don't despise her, she could have been used in a few more funny scenes. Most of the side characters also get the shaft in this movie. Mr. Krabs, Squidward, and Plankton are fairly well represented, but Mrs. Puff and Sandy barely get two lines each, and Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy only have a brief cameo in SpongeBob's room. Most of the cast only having brief cameos really did an injustice to how good most of them are. The sad thing about this is that most of these problems were eventually fixed in the sequel, Sponge Out of Water. It not only uses all of the main cast really well, besides Mrs. Puff, who only gets one line, but most of that movie's new characters were very memorable and fun to watch. I said most of its new characters. It's weird that these two movies kind of have opposite flaws, except for both having endings that are fun but come out of nowhere. It makes me wonder how the third SpongeBob movie will compare to these two. With its flaws in mind, I still respect the SpongeBob SquarePants movie because of how it was able to be such a big adventure while still keeping everything that made the series special. It's one of the few times when the SpongeBob franchise did more than just make me laugh or terrify me with disgusting imagery. It brought the characters to new and exciting places and gave the franchise a strong ending. And at least for a few months. I will admit it's got a couple of flaws and is kind of disappointing looking back on it as a fan, but it's still very good and was a nice way to cap off the original Steven Hillenburg era of Spongebob. Fairly Odd Parents used to be really great at making specials and TV movies that brought the stakes up and fleshed out the world and characters. But they nailed a great extended episode on their first try. Abracatastrophe has Timmy receiving a magic muffin to celebrate one year of keeping his fairies a secret. The muffin allows the one who eats it one rule free wish. And surprise, surprise, it falls into the wrong hands. Multiple times, actually. It transforms the world into one ruled by monkeys and another ruled by Timmy's evil teacher, Mr. Crocker. It's up to Timmy to bring the world back to normal by getting captured and then wishing his way out of the warped worlds in incredibly convenient ways. Yeah, as much as I love this movie, it's got its fair share of problems. Most of the second act adds little to the plot, some sections run on for a little too long, some parts are a little contrived, and the message makes no sense. Timmy's parents spend the movie in regret of lying to Timmy for so many years, and telling the truth is what ends up saving the day. However, in order to save said day, Timmy reveals that he has fairy godparents, which if Timmy had done in any other situation, his fairies would have been taken away from him. Timmy only told the truth when it was convenient, which is exactly what Timmy's parents were scolded for throughout the movie. This issue only really rears its ugly head at the end of the movie. Besides, the rest of it is so awesome that I almost forget about it. The new settings allow for some great animation and action set pieces. The movie is very funny all the way through. Cosmo is more than just stupid and has some shining moments. The ending is super heartwarming and Butch Hartman dies. can be a positive or a negative depending on how you look at it. The same could be said about how this is clearly a movie for fans. It builds upon the cast and gives answers to a few what-if scenarios brought up in the show. Since this was simply a TV movie and not a theatrical release that would reach a lot more people, I can understand why the creators focused on pleasing fans rather than introducing the show to a new audience. Same goes for all the Fairly Odd Parents TV movies. 
Ever Catastrophe doesn't do anything new or extremely special, and it does have a couple of problems, even though I did enjoy this movie quite a bit. But as a big fan of classic Fairly Odd Parents, it's a great adaptation that has everything that I could wish for, and with a little shift of focus, I think it would have been worthy of going to theaters. Rats in Paris, the movie, is probably the best follow-up to an animated film that isn't Toy Story 2, 3, and The Incredibles 2, I guess. I really hope that movie isn't trash. But anyway, this movie is better than its predecessor in almost every way. The animation is a little better, its character arc with Chucky overcoming his fears is very well executed, the new characters, minus Kimmy, actually make an impression, and have great voice performances behind them. It's also much more grounded in reality, with the exception of a scene during the climax of the film, which is by far the highlight and something that I will not spoil here. The trailers already do that for me. The movie also throws you off with some weird ideas that actually work well. There's a couple of cinema references that actually factor into the plot in meaningful and clever ways. Take the Godfather parody, which happens because Angelica, a three-year-old, saw the original movie by accident. I wonder how many sleepless nights that caused her. As the Bob father, Angelica promises Chucky that she'll get him a mother, and that leads her to conduct the scheme with the villain of the movie, Madame Labouche, for her to marry Chucky's father, Chaz, so she can get a promotion. The Godfather stuff could have just been a throwaway scene used to grab the attention of viewers at the opening, but I appreciate how the movie actually makes it sort of a theme that runs throughout the entire film. Even though this is called Rugrats in Paris, the movie, there's actually very little of Paris. There isn't a montage of the cast visiting various landmarks like you would expect, and instead the characters spend most of their time in Euro Reptar Land, a theme park based around the Godzilla parody featured in the show, and a takeoff of Euro Disneyland and Euro Itchy and Scratchy Land. The park itself offers a lot of unique locations, but it begs the question of why the creators even decided to set the movie in Paris at all. Well, the movie actually answers that question itself, so at the very least, it's self-aware of how weird its setup is. Gee, Scoot, seems kinda odd to have a Japanese theme park in the middle of Paris. That's a new century. Just go with Le Flow. Overall, Rugrats in Paris, the movie is not only a good adaptation, but also a great movie on its own. It adds a lot to some of the characters and follows up on one of the series' most famous episodes. But you don't even have to know about that, or even have seen the first movie to enjoy... Wait a second, go back to that last clip. Stu, what are you doing? It's three o'clock in the morning. Okay, I'm super sick, so my voice is probably gonna die while recording this entry, so goodbye, everybody. Hey Arnold, The Jungle Movie is a new TV movie that serves as not only a reboot of the 90s cartoon with much of the original cast and crew, but also to give closure to a mystery in the series that had been unanswered for 15 years. The Jungle Movie was originally meant to be a theatrical adaptation of the series, but the TV movie Arnold Saves the Neighborhood went to theaters instead with the title of Hey Arnold The Movie. Because it flopped and series creator Craig Bartlett was working on a pilot for Cartoon Network at the time, The Jungle Movie was canned. However, due to lots of fan support, The Jungle Movie has finally seen the light of day in the form of a reunion movie and potential pilot for a new season of the show. Now, before I get into The Jungle Movie, let's go over my history with Hey Arnold. Now that we're done going over my history with Hey Arnold, here's what I thought about The Jungle Movie. As someone who has minimal knowledge on the series and has only seen roughly two episodes in the first movie, I really enjoyed it. The movie really does offer an adventure that fans both old and new can enjoy. The first half hour is devoted to not only setting up the story, but reintroducing the characters in a way that doesn't feel like it's pandering to either fans or newcomers. Almost every character you could think of at least makes a cameo, and all of the side characters either get a moment to shine or play some sort of role in the story. I thought that because much of the movie would take place in a new setting, the characters might feel a little out of place. While this movie is a little more adventurous and darker than the show, the charm and humor of the characters still shines through. Even in the Indiana Jones type settings and situations, they still act like themselves. The story is the main focus, but there are still a lot of great moments of comedy and I laughed more than I expected to. While the pacing doesn't quite make this feel like a full-fledged theatrical experience, the animation and score are almost on par with one. The music can be as jamming as it was in the original series, or be very dramatic depending on the tone of the scene. The designs of the characters have also been updated just the right amount, and even though there aren't a lot of mind-blowing sequences, it still looks very nice all the way through, except for one piece of CGI animation that looks like it was actually done in 2002. I'll just say that you'll know it when you see it. If you compare the look of the Jungle movie to something like 
like the original intro to the series, it looks a lot cleaner and smoother. But honestly, the animation got cleaner and more focused on models as the original series itself evolved, and the animation here seems like a pretty good evolution of that. Honestly, the only thing I can really think to complain about are nitpicks. The villain is quite cool and menacing, but his identity is incredibly obvious from the start, and the movie is not subtle about his plan either. He also pulls a Dennis and comes back from the dead, and while he does get a good send-off, it's still a pretty lazy way to create extra suspense. There's also a part midway through where Arnold's whole class turn against him, only for them to change their minds and help rescue him a few moments later. Everyone is angry at Arnold for being focused on things that were honestly more important at the time, or not giving him a chance to explain his side of the story. This drama is created rather poorly, and it's practically reversed shortly after, so why did they even bother with it? The ending is also slightly rushed, there's very little time for the effects that the ending caused to really sink in, and it left me wanting just a bit more. Any questions that I had coming into the movie were answered, but I feel like it would have been just a bit more satisfying if it was 10-30 to 30 minutes longer. But I guess that's what the potential series is for. Not a lot of shows get a chance to fully explore all of their ideas or answer every single one of their questions, but I'm glad that Hey Arnold fans were finally able to get the resolution that they had wanted for over 15 years, and in a very good movie no less. I can recommend this movie to anyone, but fans of the show will probably enjoy it the most, and they'll probably disagree with my placing of it on this list. Outside of the nitpicks I already mentioned, the biggest problem I really have with it is that it could have been just a bit more interesting. There just could have been a bit more to its story and comedy. But as is, it's a great continuation that captures and builds upon everything great from the show. At least from what I know of it. Okay, I might not completely know everything that I'm talking about, but I did not come into this movie blind. I knew what to expect, and I was hardly disappointed. Here we are! Sponge Out of Water is what I consider to be the return of SpongeBob SquarePants in many ways. At the point at which it came out, the series was in the middle of its blandest season yet, and its current creators were recycling more ideas than they were creating new ones. At the time, my interest in the series had been very low for a couple of years, and it didn't help that Nickelodeon was literally releasing two to three episodes a year. But then Sponge Out of Water came out, and it was so incredibly refreshing. It felt like it contained all of the fresh new ideas that Season 9A was lacking, and almost constantly offered something new. Bikini Bottom turns into a Mad Max style apocalypse, there's a trippy time travel sequence where the characters end up on the edge of the universe, Spongebob and Plankton team up, and that's only scratching the surface. This movie actually fixes problems that the series had had for almost 8 years. Gone is the dry and drawn out humor and stiff character expressions that populated many of the post movie episodes. In place of them are the goofy faces and fast paced comedy that the series is best known for, and it gives us a taste of what will be done with these elements in the following seasons. The comedy in this film is great, much better than it was in the original Spongebob movie, as it's less juvenile and always doing something creative. Even when the characters reach land, the humor doesn't slow down, and there's a lot of good slapstick and really bouncy animation. Sponge Out of Water also brings the weirdness back to Spongebob. This is a franchise with a main character that's an underwater kitchen sponge who works at a burger joint and lives in a pineapple. With the show having gone on for as long as it has, it's easy to forget how strange it is, even by the standards of most cartoons. But this movie constantly asks you to accept weird new ideas. A stop motion talking doll as a guardian of the universe? Sure. The narrator's actually an evil pirate who hijacks the story to help his food truck? Alright. The main characters all turn into superheroes out of nowhere? Okay. The talking dolphin has an epic rap battle with some seagulls? I'm done. A few of these concepts border on being plot holes, like Burger Beard's motivations aren't explained and how the magic book works is incredibly confusing, but the movie doesn't spend too much time on those or any other idea. For that reason, Sponge Out of Water kind of feels like a multi-part special rather than a complete story, but the slightly weak plot doesn't detract from how much fun it is. I went more in depth on some of these slight flaws when I reviewed this movie way back in my third review, but after letting the movie simmer in my mind for another year, they really don't bother me very much. This movie plays to the series' strengths, and sacrifices a big story in favor of one that is more loose and allows for more comedy. It may not be another huge adventure that ups the ante from the TV show, most of its ideas were already done on the show in some form anyway, but it's a roller coaster of pure happiness all the way through. It's really funny, it's wildly creative, it's got two dimensions of phenomenal animation, it's the Spongebob movie, Sponge Out of Water. But seriously, what was up with that rap battle? Species. What could you know about taste? You get excited by a pile of trash on a plate While I'm a space-time traveler Fabric unraveler Saving the patties in the past But now I'm rapping, yeah
Channel Chasers is one of my favorite episodes of The Fairly Odd Parents, and it's by far the series' best TV movie. It's about Timmy using a magic remote to run away into television after feeling misunderstood and neglected by his parents. But Vicky accidentally gets a hold of a second remote, and Timmy has to travel through the different channels to stop her before she uses the remote to take over the world. The moral that this movie teaches talks about how growing up is hard, but also a good thing in the long run. This is a lesson that the series had told before and would tell again, but it's at its strongest here, due to how every part of the movie is used to tell it. A mysterious ninja who turns out to be an older Timmy travels from the future to help his younger self save the past. This subplot not only gives a silly trip through television high stakes, since we actually get to see what the future will look like if Vicky succeeds, but Timmy learns how cool he'll be when he grows up, even if that means that he'll eventually have to lose his fairies. The various TV shows that Timmy, the fairies, Vicky, and Timmy travel through lead into the subplot of this movie. Even though Timmy is absolutely fed up with his parents, he learns that he could have it a lot worse. Since most of the shows featured here emphasize how bad the parents are in most of the shows or how dangerous the universes of Tom and Jerry or Batman really are. This not only ties together all the shows that the characters visit, but it also leads up to a very good ending, where Timmy's parents send him a heartwarming message through TV. As for the shows featured themselves, all of them tweak the regular Fairly Odd Parents art style to match whatever cartoon is being parodied. There's more than a dozen different styles featured. Some of the channels get more attention than others, and the amount of depth to each parody varies quite a bit, but there was no channel that I didn't enjoy visiting, and they're either entertaining or feel interconnected with the story, and not just like filler. More than a dozen different styles are featured here, and there's even a Sesame Street parody where the characters become puppets. Today's show has been brought to you by the letter B! <laughs> My biggest problem with this movie is that I would have liked to see a couple more parodies, since all of them were so good. But there's actually a song that was entirely cut from the movie that featured parodies of a lot of other shows, like Six Million Dollar Man, Saturday Night Live, and Happy Days, officially marking the moment where the Fairly Odd Parents jumped the shark. The amount of creativity put into something that didn't even make it into the final version shows that the Fairly Odd Parents crew really went above and beyond to make this movie the best that it could be. Sponge Out of Water also had a fully animated musical number that was completely cut, but in that case, it was replaced with an exposition heavy sequence that was far worse than what would have been in its place. It's basically just the Friends theme song but with different lyrics, and that makes it better automatically. I'm only 10 years old and I'm way too young to be this disappointed with the way things are. I had it with this place and I'd be better off by far I'll be there for you. Rain stars Channel Chasers is more than just a collection of great cartoon parodies. It ties its parodies into an exciting and heartfelt story, making for one of the best episodes to ever come out of the Fairly Odd Parents. Come on! It's a beautiful sunny day, the birds are singing, and the future looks bright! Wanna go inside and watch TV? Duh! <laughs> Before we get to number one, let's have a look at my honorable mentions. On second thought, let's not. That was completely terrifying. Also, Sozin's Comet probably should have been on this list, but I completely forgot about it until I started editing. Whoopsie daisy. Also, I wanted to keep anime off of the list. Rango is about Johnny Depp playing an anthropomorphic lizard, and it's somehow a really, really great movie. I wasn't expecting to say that before I watched it, but it sucked me in and blew me away, like a vacuum cleaner. I thought that this movie was going to be about Johnny Depp being wacky and overacting for nearly two hours, like most of his movies are, and based on the first few minutes, I could see how one could think that. But this movie is actually a western. It's also a fish out of water story and a liar revealed story, however there aren't long sequences where Rango's new friends turn on him or where he desperately tries to fit in like you would expect. It only uses elements of those plots and avoids the trappings that make those tropes tiresome, making for a movie that's both familiar and refreshing. After falling out of a car and landing in the middle of the Mojave Desert, a domesticated lizard and self-proclaimed character actor ends up in a town named Dirt that is just as pretty as it sounds. He gains the town folk's trust and lies about being a hero named Rango. And after a lucky encounter with a falcon, Rango becomes the new sheriff of Dirt. There's two things that make this film great. The first is the characters. 
Rango is a liar, but he's still very likable and a good source of comedy. He just fakes his way through the whole adventure, and it's hilarious. When he returns to dirt to save the day, Rango doesn't suddenly become a great hero. His super convoluted plan just happens to work. The female lead Beans probably has the worst design in the film, and she does become a damsel in distress at the end, but she isn't here just to be a love interest or a plot device. She has both her badass and funny moments, and actually does a lot of the heavy lifting during a few sequences of the film. There's also a plethora of side characters and villains. You most likely won't remember a lot of their names, but every single one has a great character design and a memorable personality that usually fits in with the animal that they are. All of the character designs in this movie look gritty, but not ugly, and have so much detail put into their movements and textures. This is a very pretty movie, and its creative animation is used all the way through, both in small intimate scenes, like one during a campfire, where Rango uses a rod on fire to tell a story on the night sky, or during big action sequences, like one that's basically a western version of the trench run from Star Wars. There's also great creativity in small details, such as what animals the characters ride. The movie is also fairly funny. Almost all of the characters bring a good amount of comedy to the table, and I found myself laughing out loud quite a lot, especially with some of the more adult humor. May I present Madame Lupin's Tepsichorean troupe of traveling thespians? Uh, what is that? I think they thespians. Thespians? Th that's illegal in seven states. Like The Adventures of Tintin, this movie gets away with a lot for being one made for kids. The characters are constantly holding guns at each other's faces. I have no idea how some of these jokes were considered appropriate, and there's even a reference to fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Because all kids are gonna recognize that, Rango is a great movie because every single part of it feels like it was crafted with love. It pays tribute to Westerners while fixing a few of the problems that they have, and also invigorates it with some amazing animation and fun characters characters. The only thing that I can think to complain about is that it doesn't really add anything particularly new or surprising to the genre, but it's obvious that Rango isn't interested in being that. It wants to be an animated throwback to a classic genre, and it succeeds in being just that more than any other movie on this list. Remember, within all of us resides the true spirit of the <laughs> Let's take it from the top. How good Rango was tells me that Nickelodeon should be taking more risk with their animated movies. Their TV adaptations were all pretty good at the very least, but when they stepped outside of their comfort zone, they delivered their best movie yet. As it is, the future is looking bright for the studio's animated division. The Rocco's Modern Life and Invader Zim specials both appear to be shaping up great. And while I'm not quite sure how good the theatrical movie Amusement Park is going to be, it probably won't be as good as the TV show that will apparently come after it, based on what I've seen before with movies like these. I am also looking forward to the Loud House movie, a certain controversy notwithstanding, and the third Spongebob movie. As for the upcoming live action stuff, well, that's another story. My eyes!